In 1991, Eric Chahi would release a new cinematic platform action adventure game on the Commodore Amiga, and it's considered one of the best and most influential games ever. And that game was Another World. The story of Another World tells of a young scientist, Lester Knight Chaikin, being accidentally transported to an alien planet after an experiment gone wrong with a particle accelerator. Lester must then survive the alien planet's dangerous environments by solving puzzles, fighting the unknown alien race, and traversing through these six different levels in the game. Everything in Another World wants to kill Lester, and beating this game will take some patience. The game was also known as Out of This World in North America, and is considered one of the most influential games of all time. Fumito Ueda, the creator of Eco on the Sony PlayStation, would take influence from Another World. Hideo Kojima also cites that Another World was one of five games that influenced him the most. And for me personally, this stands as one of my favourite games ever made, and truly the first time that I felt like video games were art. In 1991, Another World was a masterpiece, and it's truly a stunning and unforgettable experience. Technically, Another World makes use of 2D polygons, rather than the more traditional 2D sprites with bitmap images as backgrounds, which the Commodore Amiga was very well known for. 2D side-scrollers and platformers were very popular at the time. Another World then would make use of polygons, and the Switch was quite noticeable. If we take a closer look at the introduction sequence where the particle accelerator experiment goes bad, it sets up the story perfectly. Note the simplistic low-poly aesthetic and use of colour. The Commodore Amiga was limited in most games to 32. Another World only used 4 bit planes for a total of 16 colours on screen. But even with these limitations, the engine developed for Another World also utilises transparency effects. Take a look at the tunnel sequence here, or the headlights in the GTO during the beginning. Also, take a look at Lester's shoes in this sequence. Note the laces and the contour of the shoe is defined. By use of simple shapes and lines, the game effectively replicates texture mapping to define materials. The game itself has no HUD elements, no hints and no dialogue to let the player know what to do next. It was all left up to the player with simple controls. The Amiga only has one fire button on its joystick, and it was perfectly utilised. For example, left and right will move the character to the left and to the right as you would expect, but holding down fire while pressing left and right will cause Lester to run. But by pressing fire by itself would be sort of an action button, in the early sequence in the game, it's used to stomp the alien slugs that you'll encounter, but later on, Lester will arm himself with a laser pistol. Pressing fire will shoot as you would expect, but holding it down will create a plasma ball and a protective shield, which can be then used to fight the enemy aliens. It took two years for Eric Chahi to develop and release Another World on the Commodore Amiga, and later ports came to many other home systems. But it's the Amiga version that we are going to look at today, and how it's possible with only a 7 MHz processor to pull off a 2D polygonal game run at a good frame rate and only require around 1.4 MB of data to fit the entire game. In 1989, the Amiga version of Dragon's Lair was released and it came on 6 floppy disks. This was an incredible port of the Laserdisc arcade game to the Amiga. Led by developer Randy Linden, this port creates an amazing experience very close to the original game by digitizing animations frame by frame and compressing each bitmap as an image. The code itself is quite small, only really serving up the gameplay, controllers and streaming in of the bitmap graphics for that particular scene. Still, it required 6 floppy disks, which at the time was considered quite a lot. And if you did not possess a hard disk, then you would be swapping disks in and out in order to play through the game. Eric Chahi loved what he saw with Dragon's Lair, and wanted to create his own cinematic experience. But rather than the traditional bitmap graphics approach, he would utilize 2D vector graphics or polygons. This meant that far less data would be required to be stored on disk. This would mean that real-time calculations could be used to resize polygons to any shape or size and retain the exact same vertex data. 
the Amiga was already well versed in vector graphics in both games and the demo scene. Games such as Star Glider 2 and Interphase created a suitable 3D plane for their respective games with fast 3D polygons. But the Amiga itself had no dedicated hardware for pushing polygons around, and the concept of a 2D polygonal game was not widely recognized at all. But as we'll find out, Chahi would make clever use of the coprocessor found on the Amiga known as the Blitter. At the time, there were no tools available that facilitated the construction of polygons, so Chahi would create his own, and this was done using GFA Basic on the Amiga. These tools would allow for the construction of scene designs and animations. To draw polygons themselves, Chahi would use a genlock and construct the polygons using a method known as rotoscoping, the process of manually altering polygons one frame at a time, which can result in smooth animations. A genlock superimposes a video signal over the top of the current display. The Amiga can also adjust its own screen refresh timing to match the incoming PAL or NTSC video. Genlocking was a technique that was used frequently by TV stations, advertising channels, music video production, but for the bedroom coder there were many different choices of genlock that could be purchased, and many of them weren't that expensive. But with the genlock, it would allow Chahi to create all the polygon graphics and their animations for the game. As mentioned, the Amiga has no concept of polygons at all, but the Blitter coprocessor comes with two useful features in its arsenal that would be essential to build another world, line drawing and area filling. In simple terms, line drawing does exactly that. Given two points on the screen, it will connect one point to another with a simple line. And with clever use of connecting vertices, it's possible to create wireframe graphics. And this is something that was used much in the Amiga demo scene. The second Blitter operation, Area Fill, does exactly what a Flood Fill tool does in any paint program. Fills in the polygon with color. On the Amiga, there are limitations on how Area Fill works. And we're not really going to get into that in this episode. But by using the Blitter to connect lines to vertices and use Area Fill to fill them in, this is essentially how Another World got its 2D polygonal aesthetic. But this wouldn't come free. Any Amiga coder will tell you that optimizing code is one of the most important things you can do on the hardware, and drawing many polygons on screen, even with the Blitter performing DNA and leaving the CPU free to do other tasks, comes at a cost. This is because rather than plotting pixels directly into a frame buffer via its RGB value, the Amiga graphics uses bit planes. Each bit plane has two colors, either a 1 or a 0. A 16 color game will use 4 bit planes, and this was many a sweet spot for the Amiga. Another World is a game that uses 4 bit planes or a 16 color palette at a resolution of 320 by 200. This means that each polygon would need to be blitted four times. In other words, one for each bit plane. And if this sounds like an expensive operation on the Amiga, it is. In order to maintain a steady frame rate for the gameplay, Chahi's line draw and area fill code could handle up to 50 polygons. But for a game like Another World, if you take a look at any of the scenes in the game, there are many different polygons drawn on the screen at the same time. So the question is, how then did it manage to run at a faithful 25 frames per second, or 20 frames per second in PAL region? If we take a look at the introduction sequence, when the car pulls into the scene, it's clear that there are a lot more than 50 polygons drawn on the screen at the same time. Or maybe this first sequence in the game here as well. In the background, you can see these small particles. They simulate and give the effect of the wind blowing in this particular scene. And each of these are also polygons as well. According to Fabian Sanglard's deep dive on Another World, this particular scene is made up of 981 polygons. So how was this achieved on a stock Amiga 500? The solution was once again to take advantage of the Blitter coprocessor and its ability to copy rectangular blocks of graphic data around extremely fast. Another world would make use of four individual frame buffers. Two of them are used for double buffering, but it's the remaining two that are most interesting. The first, known as Background 1, contains only the static background data. This means that all these polygons are never redrawn at all, and a Blitter copy operation will handle the rest. 
Notice how the car in the introduction sequence moves into the background as soon as it becomes static. The other background is known as background 2, and this caches the last background. This means for quick cuts like in this section, once again, it's a simple copy operation of the blitter. If we take a closer look at the scene with 981 polygons, if we separate the static background and foreground, we can see that in reality there's only a much smaller amount of polygons that are in play. The majority of this scene is static. This provides the optimization needed for another world to maintain its frame rate. Other clever tricks in the game are the color palette changes to represent certain effects. For example, the lightning strike in this intro sequence simply changes to a black and white color palette and combined with the sound effect is very effective overall. Palette swapping in the days of 16-bit was a common practice. If we take a look at this demo, the Amiga Boing Ball demo, it simulates a spinning ball rotation effect. But in reality, it's a simple cycling of color palettes. This means that there's never any copy or redraw operations needed at all. For another world then, Eric Chahi would build a small virtual machine to host the game, which consisted of all operations that were needed. And if we take a look at Gregory Montois's excellent reverse engineering of another world interpreter known as RAW, it's clear on how elegant and simplistic with only a small amount of code to build the virtual machine itself. And perhaps this is why another world ended up being ported on many different computers and consoles over the years and it's just recently celebrated its 30th anniversary. These days, you can find Another World on the Xbox and PlayStation stores, and I do recommend it if you haven't checked out the game. Now, there are many different ports of Another World slash Out of This World to many different game consoles, and it is worth checking out if you haven't played the game already, but my bias may be showing, but I believe that the original Amiga version is hands down the best version of the game because, I mean, that's where it was originally developed on. But I will also let you guys know that there is a great blog post from Fabian Sanglard, and I have referenced some of his article material in this episode, but he goes pretty deep on the different ports to the different systems. So if you are interested about the graphics and how they worked on, say, the Atari ST or the Game Boy Advance port, or even the Jaguar version of Another World, then check out his blog post, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below as well as everything else that I've referenced in this episode. There's definitely a lot of source material that I've referenced in this episode to bring it to you guys. But we are going to leave it here for this episode. This is the first video back in 2022, and I'm excited to be back in front of the camera for you guys. We have a lot of great content coming up this year, so stick around. As always, guys, if you like this episode, don't forget to put a like on it, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.